Welcome. This is Information Service Engineering, lecture number 14, ISE Applications, part 2. In this section of the lecture, we are going to talk about semantic search. It means how can semantic technologies help us to improve the search experience. So let us get back again to the information retrieval dilemma. We have often talked about that. So the problem with natural language search engines, be it web or not web, it's always natural language. Since we also know natural language has lots of difficulties and challenges that have to be solved for understanding, let's say, for example, a query. So there is ambiguity of natural language, also referred to as polysemy. We have talked about that in extents in the NLP part of the lecture. Also, different words or expression can denote exactly the same. So we have synonyms, we have metaphors, we have paraphrases. And of course, lots of the information is not directly seen in the natural language text because you have to have experience, you have to have context knowledge to exactly know what's going on there, to understand what is behind the mere literal meaning of the things that you are seeing there. And this, of course, is a complicated dilemma, especially for search. Okay, semantic technologies, knowledge graphs in particular, how can they support the retrieval process? You have also already seen this uh, tiny little graphics. So in the last lecture, when we were talking about semantic annotations, we were briefly referring here to the search process, to the information retrieval process, with, which splits in two parts. Generally two parts, the indexing process, so this is the backend stuff of the search engine and also what has to be done before you can really search. It means you start out with a bunch of documents, be it text or multimedia, no matter. Then you do some text acquisition or information acquisition from that. You transform that stuff and then you create kind of an index and then you end up with an index. And you have an index in a document store, which can be then asked by the user with a query via a user interface. And you have this user interaction which of course is also evaluated with the search engine and influences in the end the ranking, which means the order in which search results appear or are preferred or not. So this is then above that line here, the retrieval process. If we are dealing with semantic technologies, then besides the document store and the index, we also have to deal with a knowledge graph that incorporates knowledge represented within the documents, plus backend knowledge, external knowledge, which is also there. So this is connected tightly to the text transformation process, because if you have natural language text, it has to be opened up and all of the entities relations have to be somehow mapped to a knowledge graph, which of course also reflects the index creation, because there not only words are in the index, but also um, entities, of course. And on the other hand, also the user interaction. So your query has to be analyzed. Entities in your query have to be determined. What exactly are you meaning? Then probably if still your query is ambiguous, you probably have to disambiguate. So the user will be asked, will you see, let's say, if you are asking for a Jaguar, are you asking for the cat or are you asking for, for the car? And then you decide simply. So this is how semantic technology can support you. And of course, also the sequence of uh, the search results, how they are presented, the ranking might be influenced by the knowledge graph. Okay, what now will it be if semantic technology supports information retrieval? Then we come up with something which is usually referred to as semantic search. And semantic search is not only, let's say, an improved version of the search that you know, it's going beyond the documents and especially this kind of bag of words representation that you have in a, in a usual, in, tradi in a traditional search engine. A traditional search engine represents the documents that are in the search engine by its words in a kind of vector space. So usually they have kind of a one hot encoding for each of the words of a vocabulary and then a document constitutes a vector there. And this vector usually doesn't take care of the sequence of the words, for example. So therefore, here comes the notion of back of words. And of course, thereby you lose a lot of semantics. 
On the other hand, of course, it enables also, if you apply semantics technologies, it, ex it enables a deeper understanding of the document, con document content because also it leverages world knowledge, external knowledge that is also then available for the search engine in some form of structured or semantic data. And then when the result is displayed, this goes beyond these 10 blue links that you might know from Google now for a lifetime. And it provides users also with direct answers in natural languages to their questions. This is of course what current and future search engines already do. And they are employing exactly these kind of semantic technologies to solve exactly these issues. You have seen this in the very first of the lectures that we were talking about um, search engines and uh, finding information on the web. And this is now how it's going to be implemented in the end. Okay, you have lots of possibilities now in semantic search. One of the prerequisites that you have to obey is of course, somehow you have to get the semantics out of the natural language documents or let's say other unstructured data, unstructured documents. This usually can be done, for example, via explicit semantic annotation. So this is kind of a prerequisite that you annotate your document or you analyze your document accordingly. Semantic annotation, we have already talked about in the previous lecture. Then if let's say all of your entities are annotated in a text, so the word is annotated, word is usually referred to as a surface form, is annotated then with an entity from a knowledge base, you enable entity-based retrieval. This means you are looking or representing an entity not by a word, by a URI. And this of course is unique, you know, and this uniqueness also enables you to, uh, let's say, enable some form of language independence because the entity is still the same no matter in which language you are looking at it. It has many, many names in different languages and probably also alternative names that might be synonyms or metaphors or whatever, paraphrases for exactly that kind of entity. But all of that is stored within the entity. So it's an entity centered retrieval and search process. So the search then makes use of underlying knowledge bases. And this enables, of course, also to look for content based similarities among these entities. Similarity in a traditional search engine only means, okay, the words, so the string, the characters are similar. However, we can in a, in a, in a knowledge base or with a knowledge base, we can do content based similarities and we can do this rather quickly. We have learned about knowledge graph embeddings, for example. So there you have embeddings for all of your entities. And based on that, you can do quick similarity, let's say calculations and find out what is, what is close, what is nearby. And also you can do content based relationships between entities. What is related with, with, with what other thing and what exactly is this kind of relation? And you can make use of it in your search result. So this of course are the benefits by using a knowledge base in your retrieval process. Also, if you have, let's say, different kind of metadata for your documents, semantic annotations always enable interoperability. We have talked about fair research data, fair or fair metadata. Fair metadata means your data is findable, your data is A, accessible, your data is I, interoperable, and it's reusable. And interoperability is really a big issue among metadata because usually if it comes from heterogeneous sources, it's not so easy to combine that. However, if you're using semantic web technologies that we have learned here, RDF, ontologies and so on, there is always a way of, let's say, automated or semi-automated data integration. And by that, of course, it will be rather easy. So you can do content-based descriptions, structural technical descriptions that will all be incorporated in your search engine. And finally, it enables also content-based navigation within your search space. So for example, things that belong together can be grouped together, displayed and visualized together or in close proximity, or you can do content-based filtering on your search results. So these are the so-called search facets that you might have already heard. So these are possibilities that open up by the use of semantic search. Okay, so let's have a close look at What's the difference between semantic search and keyword based search and what might be the benefits? How can they be used? First of all, you can use semantic search or semantic technologies for query string refinement. 
this means for example we had this this um, example where the query string is ambiguous and the search engine then offers you let's say different directions to go for your result so for each of the meanings one direction in the end this makes your query string more precise and since here you are not looking let's say for a specific text string but for an entity your search result will also be more complete because also things that are mentioned in documents under different names will be found so this is the first benefit cross-referencing you can complement your search results with associated let's say similar additional information so for example you have a search result and there are things which are close by which are near or which are related to it and you can you can of course reference it it's not an exact match or hit then but it's okay it's a direction it's a suggestion where you might go fuzzy search is closely simple so it, it's pretty much the same so this enables the determination of nearby results or results that are related by content and by that again you are not producing exact results but nearby results fuzzy results and you might for example determine exactly what degree of fuzziness you want to have in your in your search how precise should your search be and how much let's say close by information should be included to get new ideas to find what's in there in your search space and this then leads you to something which is called exploratory search and this goes hand in hand with a visualization of your search space because this enables navigating your search space and exploring your search space we will do this in the next section of the lecture and of course if you deploy or employ reasoning which is of course possible if you have a knowledge base and a knowledge graph underlying with ontologies in your search so this enables to complement your search result with implicitly given information which is not there okay so this for example are possibilities you have to extend your traditional search whenever you do semantic search okay we will have a look or a closer look at one example so we are looking now at entity based search and we start with simple entity matching so simply uh, try to think of a query like for example we are looking for Ortelius you might remember from the last lecture Abraham Ortelius he was the author of the very first atlas so we are looking for Ortelius first atlas in the search engine for example there is a document you see here there's a document with the headline Ortelius publishes first world atlas what you have to do if you want to enable entity based search of course first thing you have to do entity linking on your query string and thereby for example Ortelius might be connected with Abraham Ortelius from DBpedia so an entity there and Atlas as an entity also from DBpedia of course you also have to do exactly the same with your document so in your document you also might besides other um, entities detect Ortelius there as well as Atlas and then of course it's easy you do simply a simple matching or exact matching and you see there you have an exact match to your query because these two entities also occur in the document so they should be in your answer set so this is very simple so this is simple entity matching you would have found exactly this document also only by doing a traditional search so no problem about that okay let's make things a little bit more complicated next try similarity based entity matching again our same question or first atlas now we have another document which is about Gerardus Mercator also a geographer and cartographer and the title of the document is Mercator's Atlas of Europe and if you look closely in there so there the name Ortelius does not occur hmm. but it's a similarity based search so we are looking for things which are similar to Ortelius so probably for other contemporary cartographers and then this would help but how is this implemented okay this is similarity based search we do again of course entity linking here in the query string as before and we do entity linking also then here in the document and the two entities i have pointed out atlas of course this is a direct match like on the last page 
and we have here Ortelius and Gerardus Mercator. The thing is that Gerardus Mercator is a rather similar entity to Abraham Ortelius. This is the case because they both were cartographers and they both lived around the same time span. So when are we considering two entities as being semantically similar? Usually, this is denoted down here, if they share property value pairs or if they share properties with similar values, then of course they are similar entities. The more entities they share, the more similar they are. And of course you have to determine kind of a threshold for your similarity considering what you want to return in your search result. And of course this is only similar, which means this is not an exact hit. So this document would be somewhere below the exact hit document. So what you do, next thing of course you do entity matching because of course Gerardus Mercator is similar to Abraham Ortelius, which is a match to exactly your query string here. And this then would be somewhere in your result set. Besides similarity, there are also relationships. So things could be related to each other. Let's have a look again at the same query and the same document. So again, we have Ortelius first atlas, and we have here again, the document of Mercator's atlas of Europe. Besides being similar, let's see whether there are, let's say more connections based on relatedness. Okay. For this, I have here um, marked up or linked the following entities. Again, Atlas, which would be a direct match. We have Gerardus Mercator, which is a similar match. And then we have here Mapmaker and Cartographer. You see here exactly how this uh, in the end um, gets together. So Abraham Ortelius also, like Gerardus Mercator, was a cartographer. And um, also here uh, was a map maker. Map maker is simply a synonym of cartographer. It's the same here. And Gerardus Mercator also was a cartographer. So both of them, Ortelius and Mercator, are connected to cartographer, which is also related here in directly in the document. Simply because of these relations here, we have a so-called relationship-based match because then you can again match Abraham Ortelius here and Atlas here. However, this path is longer than the other one. So therefore most times relationship based matching is worth less than similarity based matching. In this special case, you see here, it only emphasizes the similarity based matching because we have also Gerardus Mercator who is similar to Abraham Ortelius. And this of course emphasizes these two things. So this is how entity based or entity centered search usually is implemented within search engines. Next, we are looking at question answering. This is also something that you know already from contemporary search engines. This means as soon as in a search string at Google, Bing or any other of the search engines, as soon as an entity is detected there that is represented in the knotted graph, you will get some additional information in some kind of a box on the side of your search results for that entity. And exactly this um, is determined by the knowledge graph. And this you can also use to ask natural language questions, so-called factoid questions, which can be answered pretty well by Google. You can see this. So if, for example, we ask, when did Abraham Ortelius die? Google will answer you June 28, 1598. And this, of course, is correct. You can also ask what was the profession of Abraham Ortelius, and then he gives you a selection, so he was cartographer, historian, and also an engraver. That's interesting. Of course, to get, let's say, more information, then you have to look at one of the documents that are presented or at the entity Abraham Ortelius, which might be also referenced or linked here. And Google gives you then more information about that. But your question, you are asking for facts, your factoid question is answered. Also, if you ask what nationality was Abraham Ortelius, it will tell you Duchy of Brabant, which is exactly the place where he was born. Okay, how can we realize this in a knowledge graph? Quite easy. So what you do there is the following. We have a toy knowledge graph here for you. You see here Abraham Ortelius and you see that the guy has a birth date, a death date, and also has several occupations as well as a nationality. Now, if you are asking what was the nationality of Abraham Ortelius, 
A Sparkle query for exactly this knowledge graph is created in the following way that, of course, entities are mapped, for example, and um, you find out, for example, what you are looking for here. This is the blue thing in your Sparkle query. And then you're looking for a fact that is related to Abraham Hortelius, is this one, and a property that is here denoted by the nationality here of Abraham Hortelius. So this is quite easy. You have exactly this, this, and this, which will also be the resulting fact. And you put this here in your query string in the Spark, so in your in your graph pattern here in the Sparkle query. So you have here select the URI, what we are looking for, and then the, query, uh, the, the graph pattern you are looking for is Abraham Ortelius nationality, and then a variable, which we will call simply URI. And then applied on this knowledge graph, what you will see is then, of course, that the duchy of Brabant will be the answer. Of course, in practice, this is getting much more complicated because you have to take care of how exactly these type of questions might be set up or built up. But the principle should be clear how this works. So answering factoid questions over knowledge graphs with a search engine are not so difficult. However, factoid questions, let's say simple factoid questions, work quite easily in that way. There are much more difficult questions that are also factoid questions. For example, which popes were in office during the lifetime of Abraham Ortelius? So what we have to do is, of course, we have to get the entity of Abraham Ortelius. We have to get his lifespan. So this would be birth date and death date. And then we would have to look for popes whose regency or time in office is in between birth date and death date of Abraham Ortelius. This is of course more complicated and if you ask Google this right now, 2021 in um, July, that's not possible. Probably it will be in a few months, who knows, so then the Google Knowledge Graph would have become much better. Same or similar questions are which Frisian colleague of Ortelius is considered one of the co-founders of cartography? Probably you don't know, so this is Gemma Frisius. Or which colleague of Ortelius died of kidney stones. I have no idea, I have to look it up, I, I have to tell you. Or which places in Antarctica or the moon are named after pioneers in cartography? So you see these questions become more difficult, more difficult, more difficult. You, you ask for facts, but of course you have to go many paths, you have to consider many paths in your graph. And the more paths you have to consider, this, the more difficult the answer in the end will be. It will become even more difficult if you ask questions that are not factoid, but if you ask for why and how, because this might not be represented directly in an entity. So here for these factoid questions, usually one or a set of entity is the answer. If you ask for why, then of course you have to think and also the computer would have to think. And this so far with this technology is not possible. However, you can employ reasoning and lots of other stuffs here to answer these kind of questions. But this is, of course, subject of ongoing research. OK, now we have presented you some interesting stuff about semantic search. We have already mentioned exploratory search as one special case of semantic search, which opens up the search space for further exploration and to get more results than just plain, you know, uh, strict results, which are plain on the spot, but also on the site, nearly similar and stuff like that. And this is exactly what we are going to do when we will talk about exploratory search in the next section of the lecture.